today we'll be talking about part two of the important people in Rachmaninoff's life and how they impacted him personally and or helped shape his music and also whatever interesting stories that they may have. As with part one, it'll also kind of serve as a biography of Rachmaninoff, though by no means complete. You don't necessarily need to have seen part one for the stuff here to make sense, but when there is a bit of overlap, I'll just try to briefly explain it. Last time we left off with Rachmaninoff as a teenager, right around the premiere of his first opera and then the death of Tchaikovsky. And today we'll be talking about his cousins, the Sands, Salatis, and Scalons, his therapist, Dr. Nikolai Dahl, his literary idol, Leo Tolstoy, his friend and source of musical inspiration, Fyodor Shelyapin, his fellow composer, Alexander Scrabin, the enigma named White Lilacs, and his pen pal and confidant, Marietta Shabnian. Also, content warning for depression and anxiety surrounding death, as those are some of the topics that Rachmaninoff often wrote to Shabnian about. But without further ado, I hope you enjoy the video, and thank you for watching. So remember how Nikolai Zarev, Rachmaninoff's piano teacher that he and the other students lived with, kicked him out of the house because they had an argument over the piano? Well, Zarev arranged for him to live with another family that was the Sens, his first cousins. And if you're familiar with Rachmaninoff's life story, then yes, he does end up marrying one of them, so just heads up. Since Rachmaninoff had been kept away from his family while studying with Zero, he really lacked a sense of emotional attachment and security, which is something that these Satins were able to provide. And even though Rachmaninoff as a teenager had become more serious about his work, we still get to see a more lighthearted side of him here at the Satins. He loved playing games with the other Satin kids, for example, ball games, piggyback rides, sliding down piles of ice, and climbing up onto the edge of the roof and belting out arias just to give everyone else a heart. Time. In 1890, he spent his first summer at Ivanovka, the Satin's estate that would be a place of refuge for him basically every summer until he left Russia in 1917. Also at Ivanovka were the Scalon and Salati families, both of which were also his cousins and whose individual contributions we will get to in a bit. So basically everyone here at Ivanovka was part of one tight-knit community, something that Rachmaninoff would really miss whenever he was living alone or abroad. The estate itself was out in the countryside and it was this very peaceful environment that would allow Rachmaninoff to eventually compose some of his most famous works, like his third concerto, the Preludes, Opus 32, and the Etudes Tableau, Opus 33. He grew to love the landscape, even though it was very different from what he had grown up with as a kid. He described it as an infinite sea where the waters are actually boundless fields of wheat, rye, oats, stretching from horizon to horizon. And as an adult would spend hours driving his beloved motor car across this beautiful flatland. He also loved all of the agricultural things that he could do. He adored horses and was a very good rider and enjoyed training them. In the 1910s, when he began to manage the estate, he would invest a lot of his money in buying things like land, livestock, and machinery. And there is an account of Rachmaninoff planting 120 willow trees and watering them and watching them grow. When he left Russia in 1917, he had to leave Ivanovka behind, and the estate was confiscated by communist authorities and left to decompose. But at his later summer homes, Rachmaninoff would always try to recreate the idea environment that had brought him so much happiness and so much music. Okay, so all this about the Satins estate, we should probably get back to the Satins themselves. So Rachmaninoff and Natalia Satin had become very close after bonding over music, as she also played piano, and getting each other through their teenage emotional crises. In 1897, they wanted to get married, but were forbidden by the Orthodox Church because they were first cousins. The church also didn't like the fact that Rachmaninoff didn't often go to services or attend confession, which were two other requirements for marriage, but eventually, in 1902 by using their military backgrounds as well as getting permission from the Tsar of Russia, Sergei Rachmaninoff and Natalia Satin were finally married. Alexander Salati was a concert pianist and Rachmaninoff's piano teacher at the Moscow Conservatory. He also happened to be another one of Rachmaninoff's cousins. He was the one who brought Rachmaninoff to international fame with his performances of the Opus 3 C Sharp Minor Prelude in 1898. Rachmaninoff, until the end of his life, had mixed feelings about about this early success abroad. On the one hand, if not for the prelude, he probably would not have been in such high demand internationally as a concert pianist. In 1917, one of the main reasons that he was able to get away from Russia was the many concert offers that he 
he had received in other countries. On the other hand, he resented that the prelude's popularity overshadowed many of his other works. People were always clamoring to hear it as an encore and were never quite as enthusiastic about his newer works. Also, Rachmaninoff never got the piece copyrighted and so was not paid any royalties for it. He sold it for the equivalent of about $650. But even after the piece became extremely popular, it was the publishers who made most of the profit and Rachmaninoff himself never really earned the money that he so needed as a fledgling artist. So despite the success that it had brought him, Rachmaninoff generally disliked the piece, or at least how much he had to play. Interesting side note, one time he walked in on a jazz arrangement of the piece and he actually liked it because it was a new way of hearing something that he had heard and played hundreds of times before. Also, Rachmaninoff seemed to have had a fondness for jazz in general. But back to Salati. After the success of The Prelude, he arranged for Rachmaninoff to appear as a pianist and conductor with the London Philharmonic. It was here in 1898 that Rachmaninoff promised them to write a new concerto, which after two more years of writer's block would turn out to be the second piano concerto. And following the second piano concerto, when Rachmaninoff found himself able to compose again, he asked Salati to support him financially so he could devote time to composing, which Salati did for two years, quote, without hesitation. So the Scallon family isn't super important, but there's an interesting, I guess, story. Rachmaninoff met the three Scallon sisters, who were also, also his cousins, at his first summer in Ivanovka. Their first impression of him was that he was too morose and too uncommunicative to be friends with. That would change as they would end up bonding over their shared interest in music. Rachmaninoff's first crush was uh, the youngest of the three, Vera Scallon, which at one point, the two were caught holding hands, Vera's parents were absolutely mortified, and Rachmaninoff was banned from writing to her. So he would just write to the other two sisters and tell them to pass on the letter. Fun fact, his nickname for Vera was the Little Psychopath, not because she actually was a psychopath, but because he really liked the sound of the word. And yeah, that was kind of it. Nothing really serious ever came of it. But in 1899, when Vera got married to somebody else, she burned more than 100 of Rachmaninoff's letters, and until her death, Rachmaninoff was rather special to her. Oh, also, the three sisters told him that his hair was too messy, so he left and came back with a crew cut that he evidently had for the rest of his life. Dr. Nikolai Dahl was the hypnotist who treated Rachmaninoff following the disastrous premiere of his first symphony and whose efforts allowed Rachmaninoff to write his beloved second concerto. If you're unfamiliar with the story of the first symphony, basically Rachmaninoff wrote it thinking that everything was great, he was the coolest stuff since orthodox chant. Then for various reasons at the symphony's premiere, everything went wrong. Rachmaninoff was horrified by the sound of his own work and the critics merely sprinkled in the salts over top. Combined with a number of personal troubles, this change from extreme self-confidence to extreme disappointment with himself caused him to fall into a three-year depression and writer's block, where from 1897 until 1900, he composed basically nothing. During this time, while he was able to make a living for himself by conducting at an opera theater, he frequently struggled with feelings of self-doubt as a composer. This fear that he wasn't good enough as a composer was the main thing that prevented him from writing anything, which in turn worsened his depression. His friends and family were very worried about him, and finally after three years, they got him started on therapy with Dr. Dahl, who was a specialist in neurology and hypnosis and was also a viola player. His therapy sessions consisted of taking care of Rachmaninoff's physical health, having long conversations with him, and hypnosis, where Dr. Dahl would put Rachmaninoff into a trance and then say to him over and over again, you will write a great concerto. And yes, I know it sounds really weird, but this treatment was actually really effective. Basically how it worked was that the failure of the first symphony had triggered in Rachmaninoff a stream of negative thoughts about his abilities as a composer, and Dr. Dahl was able to stop those doubts enough for Rachmaninoff's natural creativity to shine back through and for him to write the second concerto. And although I don't believe Dr. Dahl was able to completely cure Rachmaninoff's writer's block or his depression, because unfortunately both would come back to haunt him, I think what he did was nonetheless still pretty amazing. Like, to get your patient out of a three-year hiatus and compose again, that composition now being one of the most enduring pieces in classical music history, I think 
that deserves respect. Out of gratitude, Rachmaninoff dedicated this concerto to Dr. Dahl, and at one performance of the piece, the audience found out that he was actually playing in the orchestra, and they wouldn't leave until he had stood up and was recognized for his indispensable contribution to music. Leo Tolstoy. <laughs> so basically, after the first symphony, when Rachmaninoff's self confidence had hit a new low, his friends and family thought that he might feel better if he paid a visit to one of his favorite authors. So Rachmaninoff went to see Tolstoy and played some of his pieces for him. Tolstoy at this time was kind of an old grouch and had a very narrow minded view of what he thought could be considered art. And his opinion on Rachmaninoff's music was nah. I don't like it. And so after having his last shred of self-confidence be picked clean, Rachmaninoff went to see Tolstoy one more time, hoping that this time might be different, but it wasn't. And even though he would be invited to Tolstoy's again, he never went back. Fyodor Shelyapin was a bass singer that Rachmaninoff met while he was conducting at the Opera Theater between his first symphony and second concerto. Musically speaking, he and Rachmaninoff were great sources of inspiration to one another. Rachmaninoff was the one who taught Shelyapin how to study all of the roles in an opera he was playing, and not just his own, a practice that Shelyapin would continue throughout his entire career. Shelyapin taught Rachmaninoff the concept that each piece of music is centered around a climax, or a central point that everything else built up to. This climax could be either loud or soft, with soft ones sometimes being more effective because it was like confiding in a secret. Whatever the dynamic or wherever this climactic point was located in the piece, it should be like the shattering of glass or the snapping of the tape at the end of the race. Or more poetically, liberation from the last barrier between truth and its expression. This concept of a central point would be extremely important to Rachmaninoff as a concert piano and he would be very upset with himself for missing the point, regardless of how the rest of the performance went. Rachmaninoff and Shalyapin were also very successful as a performing duo, whether in opera productions where they often received critical and public acclaim, or at informal gatherings with other musicians, where their performances were described as achieving miracles and the inspired ecstasy of two great artists. And many of Rachmaninoff's songs and operas were written with Shalyapin's singing voice in mind. Playing with Shalyapin also helped to improve Rachmaninoff's mood, as meeting the very high musical standards that he set for himself was a key source of happiness for him. And so at many of these musical gatherings, Rachmaninoff was unusually lighthearted and, you know, actually smiling. When Shalyapin got married, Rachmaninoff and a group of friends, all holding various pots and pans and other domestic appliances, stood outside Shalyapin's window and played him a tin pan symphony to congratulate him. After Rachmaninoff left for America, he was very homesick for his native country, something that contributed to his unhappiness as well as his writer's block at the time. So whenever Shalyapin would visit, Rachmaninoff would be very happy to see him and play music together, just like the old days, because Shalyapin Shalyapin brought with him a tiny bit of home. Just before Shalyapin died in 1938, the last thing he told Rachmaninoff was that he wanted to write a book about the art of the stage. Rachmaninoff in turn said that when he retired, he would also write a book and it would be about the one and only Fyodor Shalyapin. Alexander Scrabin was a composer and one of Rachmaninoff's contemporaries. He and Rachmaninoff were very different, musically speaking. Although they were both obsessed with the end and all things apocalyptic, they took very different paths to it. Scrabin was more about mystery, the superhuman, ecstatic inspiration. People often describe his playing as taking flight. Rachmaninoff, on the other hand, was more about human suffering and being rooted to earth. This difference contributed to the public being divided between too. Rachmaninoff and Scrabin were often compared against each other and even said to be enemies, though in real life they were more friendly towards one another and even played a concert together just to diffuse those rumors. However, this constant comparison took its toll on Rachmaninoff's self-confidence as a composer. He even mentioned quitting composition altogether because people didn't seem to like his music anymore which I can assure you was not and still is not true. Scrabin died in 1915 and Rachmaninoff was so impacted by his funeral that he remembered it in great detail even years later. And it may have been the inspiration for his A2 Tableau, Opus 39, number 7, which Rachmaninoff said represented a funeral. As another tribute to Scrabin, Rachmaninoff played a series of concerts devoted to his works. The audience once again noted the difference between the two composers as Rachmaninoff didn't try to imitate Scrabin's 
style of playing and instead composed his own interpretations. Rachmaninoff's fans liked his playing well enough, but Scrabin's fans were less enthusiastic, saying that his interpretations lacked Scrabin's key element of flight and were too grounded. This negative reaction, as you can probably guess by now, reinforced his self-doubt and caused his depression to resurface for a time. But if it's any consolation to Rachmaninoff, all of us here are living proof that his music is loved and will continue to be remembered. White Lilacs is the bizarre story of one of Rachmaninoff's fans who, beginning in 1910, would send him a bouquet of white lilacs after every concert, and also on every birthday and every saint's day and whatever other excuses there were to send flowers. The choice of lilacs was probably a tribute to Rachmaninoff's Opus 21 song called Lilacs. Along with the bouquet, there would sometimes be a small gift or note attached in which the mysterious person wished him well but always remained anonymous. In 1914, at a performance of Rachmaninoff's choral symphony, The Bells, they sent him this elaborate display of bells made of tiny lilac flowers. Rachmaninoff was touched by this person's extraordinary efforts. I mean, they sent him flowers basically non-stop from 1910 until he left Russia in 1917. Like, that's commitment to the cause. Finally, in 1918, it turned out that it was a woman named Rousseau. She had been looking for Rachmaninoff and was happy to learn that he was doing well, or at least sort of, in America. When Rachmaninoff was informed, he offered to bring her out of Russia and all the political turmoil, but she preferred to stay in Moscow. So yeah, that is the, I guess, wholesome story of White Lilacs. Marietta Chavignon was Rachmaninoff's pen pal from 1912 until 1917, who provided him with both musical inspiration and emotional support. In her own right, she was a prolific writer of poetry, novels, philosophical pieces, as well as a literary critic. As for the beginning of their correspondence, Chavignon wrote to Rachmaninoff first, remaining anonymous and using the name Ray, as in Do, Re, Mi. Eventually, Rachmaninoff would guess that she was Marietta Chavignon and they would meet in person but that was much later. After this first letter, Rachmaninoff wrote back and asked if she could give him some poems for him to set to music. She gave him some contemporary Russian poems, and the resulting songs would go on to make up about half of his Opus 34, and later she would also provide the text for his Opus 38 songs. It's interesting to note that when Rachmaninoff was asking for these poems, he said that they should preferably be sad ones because bright tones didn't come easily to him. Rachmaninoff and Ray also had discussions on literature, as different as their tastes were, with Ray sending him a book of poems to read and Rachmaninoff being, quote, horrified. Ray was also someone that Rachmaninoff could confide in for his more personal struggles, Rachmaninoff being someone who didn't usually like opening up to others, and Ray would listen and help him through them. Around 1912, Rachmaninoff was doing really well in his career, but still struggled with feelings of self-doubt as a composer. He told Ray that when he was younger, composing used to come very naturally to him, but after the failure of his first symphony, he had lost all faith in his own work. And now he still had the desire to be creative, but his crippling self-doubt prevented him from actually composing. We see here that Rachmaninoff's writer's block, although partially cured by Dr. Dahl, never really went away throughout the rest of his life. And it also supports the argument that after Rachmaninoff became a full-time concert pianist in 1917, his busy touring schedule was not the only thing that prevented him from composing. In his letters to Ray, Rachmaninoff also talked about his mental illness and his own awareness of how it impacted his work and life. He said, I have had almost no other doctor for the past 20 years than the hypnotist doll and my two first cousins. All these doctors taught me one thing, to take courage and have faith. Sometimes I have succeeded in this, but the illness hangs on to me tenaciously and with the passing years digs in ever more deeply. He also admitted to Ray his extreme fear of death. He said, it's impossible to live while one knows one must die after all, and he kept asking her on her thoughts about the afterlife. And side tangent, Rachmaninoff's philosophy of death and how it changed over the course of his life is a very interesting topic, and it could be a whole other video. Throughout this whole conversation with Ray, Rachmaninoff had seemed very anxious, he was crying, and it seemed like he had aged a lot. After Ray suggested some new poems that he could set to music, and after accompanying Shao Yapin and another singer, Rachmaninoff seemed a little better. Ray's mother also helped in her own way. She told his fortune and gave him some salted pistachios to eat, after which he said he was feeling better. In 1917, Ray, who was now married, 
went to see Rachmaninoff at one of his last concerts in Russia. They talked for a while, but at the end of it all, Rachmaninoff could not bring himself to say goodbye. Later that year, he left Russia and they never saw each other again. Now a point of debate, and what some of you are probably wondering right now, is the exact nature of the relationship between Rachmaninoff and Marietta Shagman. It's true that some of their letters border on being romantic. For example, Ray had asked him what he loved in life, and Rachmaninoff said that after his children, music, and flowers, he also loved her and her letters, and then he said he would add his wife to that list as well. But I think that their relationship was mostly emotional and intellectual. On the emotional side, she helped him with his emotional and mental health and tried to get him to believe in himself. On the intellectual side, she gave him poems to set to music, discussed literature with him, and tried to get him to spend more time talking to other composers like his contemporary Nikolai Metner, who he admired. And I think it's interesting to note that even after Rachmaninoff found out her name, he always called her Ray, quite possibly because that was who she was to him. A very intelligent and interesting person who he could have meaningful conversations about literature and art with. But if you want to read their letters, or at least the English translations, and decide for yourself, you can find some of them quoted in the Burdensen and Leda biography, which is linked in the description. So yeah, that's it for a rather hefty part two. We saw the beginnings of Rachmaninoff's international career with Alexander Salati, more of his musical influence with Fyodor Shelyapin, and a bit more of his struggles with his mental health with Dr. Nikolai Dahl and Marietta Shagina. Biography-wise, we got from just before the first symphony disaster to just before he left Russia, though we did touch on a few things after that. So we roughly covered the middle section of his life. There may or may not be a part 3 on the topic of future videos, although I will do a few more on Rachmaninoff, I will get to other composers. I'm thinking either Shostakovich or Chopin next. Also, there will be more stuff like the hairpin video, so more analytical and research-based than just storytelling. And maybe the one on Rachmaninoff and death, cause I don't know. That one sounds kind of fun, but we'll see about all that. For now, I hope you all learned something interesting, thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye. Guys, Shoyafin has a steak named after him. So one time he was having trouble with his teeth, but he still wanted to eat steak, and so he got the hotel chef to cook it in a way that was soft enough for him to eat. He did this with like onions and some sort of chemical reaction or other. And apparently he liked it so much that they named the steak after him. <laughs> that makes me feel a lot better.